I'm very pleased to get our next session started in Empowering Women, and I'd like to introduce Janice Bierman, Senior Vice President of Education and Health Promotion at the March of Dimes Foundation. Please welcome Janice Bierman. Thank you very much, Russ, and thank you to the other organizers for inviting me to participate in today's conference. Always tough to follow the lunch. So if you feel like a little sleepy, you know, you want to stand up, that's fine with me. And fortunately, I have two wonderful, wonderful teammates here, Dr. Carla Damis and Dr. Sarah Robiste, who will certainly keep you awake if I put you to sleep. And it's a privilege to be with Carla and Sarah today. So the, the title was given to me, Empowering Women. And I have to say, every time I hear that word empowering, and this will give you a hint of how old I am, I see the cover, the first cover of Ms. Magazine in uh, December of 1971 with Gloria Steinem on the cover. And then that made me think about that word and the work of Ms. Magazine, which was a magazine by women for women. And in, I did a search of all the titles um, since 1971, and I didn't find any cover article that had the word empower. So while they may not have written about it, they modeled the behavior of empowerment by being a magazine by women for women. So <coughs> empowerment, this is the definition from Webster's, and it means to give authority or, um, or authorize or enable or permit and I, I know you all know that. And what's disappointing to me is the fact that we have to talk about empowering women today, 42 years after that first issue of Ms. Magazine. So it's just made me think about how far we've come and yet how far we haven't come. This is a similar model to what Dr. Kotelchuk shared with us today. He showed us his model, and this is a model of uh, learning behavior that many people use and we've used in our work at the March of Dimes, the socioeconomic model of change, and it really shows five spheres of influence when you're trying to change behavior. So very often in the title of this talk, we talk about empowering women, so it seems as if we're even focusing on women. But in fact, there are other ways and, and other necessary activities that you have to do, I think, to actually change behavior. And in this case, you have the individual focus, you have the focus of, it's titled here, interpersonal. It's very blurry, I'm sorry. I just didn't get a good enough image to, uh, for my slides. But really, that exchange, say, between the provider and the patient, the provider and the woman. The organizational sphere of influence, so in this case, in work that we've talked about earlier today with assessment of preterm labor and focusing on early elective deliveries, work in a hospital system. You have work and sphere of influence of the community where a woman lives where she works, where she plays, all those people in those communities can influence her behavior, and then public policy. Um, and you know that probably, in many cases, when you're trying to change behavior, particularly in a public health arena, that might be the most influential, most powerful, and really the way to enact behavior. One example, of course, would be seat belts. So once, once seat belts were part of our um, you know, ticket or what's the word? Click it or lick a ticket, yes. Uh, <laughs> we had more and more people uh, using seat belts. Um, but I think um, it, you know, for changing behavior, it's not enough just to focus in on one of these. So it's not enough, I don't think, just to focus in on the woman and trying to impart information. That if you really want to change behavior, you have to have activity in several of these different spheres of um, influence. So I've, I've talked with Carla and Sarah before this talk today, and we decided perhaps the better title for this talk is not just empowering women, but what we're talking about is empowering families and communities. Oh, sorry, I thought I changed it. Maybe if I focus in here. Okay, and part of the other thing that I was asked to talk about today is about educational campaigns, or at least that's how I interpreted what I was asked to do. Um, and again, I think it's not enough just to provide information, not to just impart information, to educate, say, in putting information on a website or in a brochure, but to have activities that build on those learning experiences. And um, these are definitions, are reasons for doing uh, educational campaigns. One, of course, is the second bullet, to raise awareness about an issue. And then ultimately, three are activities to actually uh, disseminate messages that hopefully over time would help change uh, behavior. 
And um, there's paradigm of knowledge plus attitudes equal behavior change, and this sort of builds on all of that. Now, I've had the privilege since I've been to the March of Dimes to work on two educational campaigns. The first was folic acid, which was our national campaign from 1999 through 2002. Many of you in this room certainly know about the folic acid campaign and did as much or probably more than I ever did in that uh, area. And then the second campaign is our current campaign as, well, our current campaign is prematurity and this, the consumer focus is healthy babies are worth the wait. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And one, one thing to remember with campaigns, there's multiple activities and they're coordinated activities. And I think that's something that we should think about too as we go through the day. So again, as I said, many of you have worked in the folic acid field and so you know that we had multiple components to our campaign. We had our consumer education, we had professional education, we developed toolkits, we did work out in the community, we worked with many partners, we actually gave a grant to the schools of Allied Health, so we branched out, not just focusing on physicians and nurses, but also, um, there were seven of them, you think I'd remember them, but social workers, occupational therapists, et cetera, I mean, just different dentists um, that we, we helped to train and teach them about folic acid and why it's important to a woman's health and to ultimately to our baby's health if she chose to get pregnant. Um, and then we did a, a public campaign, and you might remember some of the work we did about that, and if you didn't, I'm gonna have images to show you. Um, hmm, sorry, I'm always, I'm always challenged with these things. Um, I mentioned that we did provider uh, education, and we did, and actually Dr. Carla Damas did many, many grand rounds across the country talking to doctors and nurses about folic acid, why it's important, how to speak to, uh, about it to your patients. And we routinely, through 2002 through 2005, did surveys, both of the women who we were trying to educate about folic acid, as well as healthcare providers. And this is a long list of issues that are commonly addressed in a well women visit by OBGYNs. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the numbers. The important part is, if I learn how to use this, um, folic acid, well, first iron supplements, and then secondly, folic acid, is one of the topics that was least likely to be talked about and discussed in a well woman visit all the time. There were other topics that rose to the top, at not folic acid. And it wasn't that providers didn't know about folic acid. They knew about folic acid, but there were just too many things to talk about in a 10 minute, 15 minute session. So the approach we took then was that then we need to empower women. We need to say, it's okay. If your provider is not talking about folic acid, then it's your role to bring it up. And so we developed a, what we call a tool, but really it's an educational piece. This is Talia, uh, um, an actress, uh, singer who was very kind and posed for, the, for this brochure. Um, and it's, you know, I'm not pregnant, but I want my nine months someday. That's not the important part. The flip part is the side. And there are nine questions for you to ask your provider about. So it's just giving her a framework, suggested questions for her to engage in a conversation with the provider. And one of those questions is, what do I need to know about folic acid? Not know about it, because actually women knew the words, and, and I'll show you a slide that supports that. But what do I need to know about? Why is it important? Do I need to consider it? What do I need to do? So it's really about connecting um, and, and uh, f forging an, uh, a conversation with a provider. Now we did, as I said, not only focus in on educating the woman, but also educating the community. And we did that in many different ways in media. This is Daisy Fuentes, and um, again, she says Daisy Fuentes is pregnant. The important here is we took the approach of sex, sex sells, and this was a billboard that was like everywhere, er, seemingly to me, and I did a lot of traveling in those mm -hmm. early years. I'd always see Daisy Fuentes, but perhaps because I knew she was out there. But I had all my male, non March of Dimes colleagues, but all my other male colleagues would always say to me, I saw her in the airport. I mean, they always <laughs> noticed the daisies. Now, it wasn't, we weren't really trying to reach out to the men, but I think we were successful in that part because, unfortunately, sex sells. The other approach we used was humor, and these were TV ads where we used to stork, the only stork in show business in Hollywood, and one-legged disabled stork, but she did his work, her work, and uh, so that was one way of bringing the folic message out to women um, on TV. I don't think the sex approach or the humor approach will work when we're talking about antenatal corticosteroids, but it is just something to consider that 
maybe we won't go in that direction, but there would be other ways of delivering the information, and, and I'll have a way to suggest that. Um, campaigns take a lot of resources. Uh, so you need a lot of money, you need a lot of time, you need a lot of coordination activities. And when you're investing all that, all those resources, you want to know, well, how are you doing? So I think it's really important then to have metrics of success and to measure what you're doing. And we, are, we tried to measure three things. What do women know about folic acid? Did their awareness change? What do providers know about folic acid? And did their knowledge and behavior change? And then ultimately, what about the rates of neural tube defects? Did they actually go down? And so we were fortunate to have funding from the CDC to do an almost yearly um, Gallup survey of women of childbearing age. And you can see over time from 1995 through 2008 actually was the last year in which we did this survey that awareness of folic acid actually went up. So this is asking a woman, have you heard the words folic acid? And so when we started, even before we started the campaign, 1995, 52% of those respondents said yes, they knew the words folic acid. And by 2008, actually 84% of the women said that they know the words folic acid. So I think we, with our many partners, actually increased awareness just about the words folic acid. So that was a success. However, when you ask about do you know that folic acid should be taken before pregnancy and during the early few weeks of pregnancy? Here, while we had a statistic statistically significant increase in knowledge from 2% of the women respondents in 1995 saying they knew it was why it was important to take it, up to a whopping 12% in 2007. So yes, that's you know a great increase, but only 12% of the women knew why it's important. We really didn't do our job. I don't think. And then the behavior we were trying to encourage was that of taking a multi-daily vitamin. And over time, really, from 28 to a high of 40%, it, you know, it didn't change too much. So it's a tough behavior to change. And I think that's another thing we need to remember. And then generally, behaviors don't change uh, you know, in a day or two. It took 17 years for smoking rates to decrease in this country from the first Surgeon General's report on the hazards of smoking to actually seeing rates of smoking uh, being reduced in our country. So behavior takes time, or behavior change, I should say, takes time. So here are some of the lessons learned from our folic acid campaign that I think we need to consider when we're talking about antenatal corticosteroids, and that is, again, Awareness, just because you raise awareness about an issue or about words, it doesn't necessarily and usually doesn't easily equate to behavior change. Um, that you need many partners. It's not enough just to have one organization out there talking about an issue. That really, if you want to advance things from my own experience and from our work at the March of Dimes, you need to engage many people, and that's why we're all here in the room today. That uh, in our own experience, we were more successful, I think, in particularly reaching out to women with activities in, on the, in the community level because that's where their sphere of influences were, that they felt connected and that enabled e easier learning, actually, when you're learning with people that you know. Um, that you always have, I think it's important to have the same message going out to both provider groups and the women. Now, the way you deliver that message, the media you use might be slightly different, but it's really important, I believe, to have concurrent messaging with your healthcare provider as well as your consumer and your target women. And when it comes to behavior change, in this case, I think our rates of neural tube defect have decreased over the years, but I don't think it decreased because of our messaging about taking multivitamin. It, it happened because we got enriched grain products fortified with folic acid. So that was a policy change, something that affected the masses, even without even knowing about it. So similar to having a law on seat belts, we have enriched grain products, and that's really what drove down the rates of uh, folic acid. Still, though, important to have this other messaging and to take your multivitamin, et cetera. And with any campaign or any message you're trying to get out there or any tr behavior trying to change, you can't do it in a year. You have to sustain that effort and you have to have multiple um, years of commitment with many, many resources. So the second campaign is our Healthy Babies Are Worth the Wait, and this is one that's currently in force. It started in June 2011, so actually already three years ago. And it was intended to build on ACOG's uh, guidance, their company opinion, which originally came out in 1979, that um, elective 
uh, inductions or C-sections shouldn't be done before 39 weeks of gestation. So that was really the impetus for our own care campaign. And really the messages, the major message of our campaign is one of empowerment because it says, if you're gonna schedule your baby's birth, don't do so before 39 weeks. So you're saying, or what we're trying to say to the woman is, it's your choice to schedule, that's fine. But if you choose to do so, don't do it before 39 weeks because there are things that could happen to your baby's health. So that was the overarching and continues to be overarching message of our baby. We don't, in-house we refer to it as our 39 week campaign, but really the name of it is Healthy Babies Are Worth the Wait, and I'll share with you why that's important. Um, and our secondary major uh, message is, you know, just wait for labor to begin on its own. So this too is a campaign that has many, many components. We have some educational materials that actually we had started providing messages um, around this issue well before 2011, actually in 2008. If we have advertising, we use search engine um, and, uh, optimization, SEO, um, so that when you plug in the words um, uh, elective EDs, you would get information from March of Dimes. Um, we have activities in providers' offices, movies, we came out with promotionals. I mean, many of you in this room are involved in some way with this campaign, so you know all the things we, we offer. Um, so this is a brochure that actually uh, explains, and it came out in 2008, so it was the first piece of the campaign before we even knew we were gonna do a campaign, providing information about why it's important to wait as long as possible before you have your baby, and it explains all the things that could be happening to the baby and why it's better for your own health. And this builds on work that originally Dr. Damis did in Kentucky with her colleagues there in the Healthy Babies Are Worth the Wait campaign. And then we develop the next two pieces, which again, many of you know, the provider piece and the consumer complementary pieces with perhaps the image that I think is probably the most compelling that we, any of us have ever seen. If, if you show this comparison of a baby's brain at 35 weeks to a baby's brain at 39 to 40 weeks, people get it without saying anything else. They know what you're talking about and why it's important to wait. So it's a wonderfully compelling um, image. However, it works, the, the, um, we affectionately call it the brain card, the image to the left. That's a piece for providers. And I know people tend to use this piece with consumers, which really isn't the right thing to do because it puts the brains out there. And while it's very compelling and you know, has stop power and it grabs people's attention, particularly women's attention, it can scare women too. It can make them feel guilty if they had already had a baby born preterm. And so that's why we came out with a consumer flyer because it has the same image in there, but it has context around it. And so you lead with the information and then you can show the image and it doesn't scare women. So it's okay to take an important message and share that with women, but you have to do it in the right way, I believe, and in context. And so um, I think these pieces work uh, for that reason. They're just appropriate for the audience. Um, so I mentioned that the name of our campaign is not the 39 weeks, although the title of the slide is 39 weeks poster, um, but the, the campaign uh, title is Healthy Babies Are Worth the Wait. And when we were doing our formative research, we did focus groups. So we met with many women across the country, small groups, because um, we wanted to learn from them how to talk about this, how, how, what language to use, what are the images to use. And we had many different images, some of them were humor, and the humor stuff no woman liked at all um, because it was a serious topic. It was about the health of their baby and they said to us, just give it straight on. We want to see a pregnant woman. We want the end message here, so that's healthy babies are worth the wait. They understood that and they, they wanted that to happen. Um, and then they just wanted the information, very straightforward. We actually had one headline that we tested that said March of Dimes says, or I don't know if it said March of Dimes, it was a brand of March of Dimes, but don't induce before 39 weeks. Now women read that, were, that, that headline, but what they heard was, well, it's coming from the March of Dimes, so it must be okay to induce <laughs> before 39 weeks. Not what we were intending to convey, but that's how they interpreted it. So we did away with that, and we said this is how we ended up with this. This was our first poster here. And the, the body just explains why it's better to wait, because important things are happening to your baby's brain, lungs, et cetera. Um, so that, that was a, a good piece for the first 
phase of our campaign. And then this is like the second generation of the campaign. So these are materials we currently have out there now of a pregnant woman, don't rush your baby's birthday, and we give the same information. And when you're doing campaigns, and it's a multi-year com commitment, you do, I think, need to freshen up the message, freshen up the images, to, just to keep people engaged and to uh, grab their attention. So th the actual content hasn't changed, it's just the way in which you're delivering the information that um, I think is, is good. So I won't say too much about this toolkit because the um, authors are in the room and it's wonderful and we all know the powers of this toolkit and I know there's a session about this tomorrow. But what I love about this toolkit is the fact that it calls out about the importance of patient education, provider education, and community or public education. And, and that was really the first time in a long time that there's a focus on all the importance of this. So I, I congratulate you all and thank you all for doing that shout out for education and really all of all the stakeholders involved in this issue. And uh, this is my most favorite diagram out of that toolkit. And when I was on the plane, I was reviewing my slides, and I was saying, you know what this is? This is actually a redesign, I think, of the socio-ecological model, which hadn't hit me before, but it is. And it's just in the context of this you know, QI activity. It's blurry, I know, but you all know the toolkit by heart, so you know what it says. But really, really it has the call out of the importance of educating the clinicians and patients, and then um, uh, the awareness, I'm um, sorry, uh, yep, educating the public. It has calling for hospital policy, so that's a policy sphere of influence there, um, and QI and data, of course. So it's got almost all the levels of actual behavior change in a hospital system in the context of doing CQI. So <laughs> I thought that was really cool. So um, I just wanted to. Um, also say that other work was going on at the same time. So we had the toolkit, we had Marta Dimes campaign, we have this article that came out by Dr. Kathleen Simpson um, actually using education materials in a hospital setting with women and in fact behavior, the decision not to elect early uh, was a changed behavior in the group of women who received education about it in a, in a learning collaborative type of uh, setting. So education can work, and here in recent data from um, the uh, CMMS and uh, LeapFrog, the article that came out a f few months ago where we're seeing actual rates um, reduction in, uh, actual reduction in the rates of early elective deliveries. So our work together, not just the March of Dimes, but the March of Dimes and all the many, many partners we have across the states, many, many efforts going on with the same message and the same you know, activities or even sp different spin on activities, but it's actually making a difference and I think we should all feel good about that. So now about antenatal corticosteroids. Um, I did a search uh, and I said, okay, well what's out there for the consumer, for the woman, for families, if they wanna understand what we're talking about or they need to understand what we're talking about, what's currently out there? And um, ACOG has, uh, they, they have a, they mentioned the words, um, in their revitalized definition. Maybe, maybe, I'm not even sure there's a sentence there, but maybe there's a sentence to support that. They have certainly a committee opinion. And for the consumer, if you go to the consumer website of ACOG, one of their questions, FAQ, addresses um, steroids. So that's seemingly the extent of the information they have. I might have missed something, obviously. A1 and from the consumer point of view, I didn't find anything on your website, but maybe for your members, there, there could be information certainly, but I didn't see anything. Um, and I'm not the best searcher, so it's quite possible I, I missed something. Baby Center, a popular source of information from women, does have inf a paragraph or so on steroids, so there's something out there currently. Um, American Pregnancy Association, some would say is a good source of information for women about maternal child health issues. I had found one sentence in their website. Certainly there's something on Wikipedia and when I did a Google search, the first thing that comes up um, was um, WebMD, followed by Wikipedia for listings of information. And then my own website, March of Dimes, and my team writes for the web. And so I'm embarrassed to say we did have maybe a paragraph or two, not a whole lot of information. So the good news is, as a result of being invited to participate in this conference, my team rewrote their article for the web and it's in Clarence. So hopefully <laughs> this week we'll have new and improved information. 
on our web. I certainly hope so. But certainly there's a need for information and for good information out there, so there's one area that we can do some work. I think when we're talking about educating women, it's not just enough to have a brochure or something on the website. There are other factors to consider. Um, and one of those, of course, is health literacy, the level uh, which we're reading. In March of Dimes, we try to write all of our print materials at the fifth grade reading level. And that's hard. You don't want to dumb down the information, but you do need to bring it down to a level where anybody can understand. And you can always have resources, say our web or other websites, where a woman or a family who wants to learn more can go and get more information. But in your very basic brochure or whatever, you need to put it in a language that people can understand. There's certainly cultural implications that we need to be aware of. I don't know specifically in this case, but it's something you know all educators should keep in mind is what are the cultural um, influences and, and implicators for um, messaging. Certainly all the information needs to be science-based, and I think Marcia Dimes tries to do that to make all of our consumer messages based on the latest uh, current science, and I think that's important. Languages, it's not enough just to have information in English. You need to have it in English, Spanish, possibly Chinese. If you're in a community, that's why community um, engagement's important. That's your opportunity to target specific. So it may be a community of Hmong women, and you need to have the, uh, the language, what is the Hmong? Well, I'm blanking on the name, but uh, <laughs> the Hmong language? Well, whatever. Um, whatever the, the population is, if it's Serbian or Serbo-Croatian or whatever, you, you need to you know, write in the level, the, the, the language that that community uses. And then there's some societal things that I think we need to think about. Acid, when we're talking about folic acid, some of the feedback we got from women is, well, acid, acid's a bad thing. You, know, you can trip on that. You can have hallucin hallucinations, right? So that wasn't a good word to use at times for certain groups of people because it had a bad connotation. And similarly with steroids. I mean, think about that. We have hero Lance Lan uh, Armstrong, right, on steroids, or some of these baseball players on steroids, A-Rod. That's not a good thing. You can get into trouble when you take steroids. So I think we need to be sensitive to some of the so uh, side, my word, so social context of words. Sorry. Maybe I had too much caffeine, my little brain's going crazy. Um, and then there's some opportunities, I think, for engaging and empowering women. And one is group prenatal care. Of course, the best known model for group prenatal care is centering pregnancy. But for those of you who are not familiar with uh, prenatal care, uh, centering pregnancy model, it's a group of women actually learning and helping each other and teaching one another in a prenatal care. So they take each other's weights or they do the blood pressure and they share information. So it's very supportive environment and research has shown that women learn well in this environment. And um, so that might be an opportunity to infuse information about uh, steroids uh, the good type of steroids into the curriculum, if you will, for group prenatal care. And then another concept I think that's important for us to remember is that of shared decision making, which is collaborating the patient and the physician, um, making a healthcare decision together. And actually ACOG, I believe, came out with a committee opinion back in 2011, so it's already three years old, which it encourages um, in order to have effective patient-provider communication, you really have to adapt and practice this model of shared decision-making, working together as a team, understanding what the situation is, looking at best practices, looking at the latest science, and making the decision that's right and best for the woman. So. Our recommendations um, for empowering uh, women and families, and I'm sorry, they're not prioritized and they're not uh, groups, so I'll just sort of read through them. But they're basically themes of education, um, of um, partnering and getting the message out, and, and possibly doing campaigns. I think campaigns can be effective, too. So um, the first is to have a conversation about women with I chose to use ACS, and it wasn't until uh, Russ's talk this morning, I was like, why didn't I use ACT? But I think that's, a, that's something for us to discuss in this course of this meeting. What actually are we talking about? You know, and what are, how are we going to talk about 
steroids to women and to providers, you know. Do you use the whole long name or do you, sh you know, use your acronym? But anyways, it's important to emphasize to women that perhaps it is a choice and women need to know that they do have choices, that, but they really need to have the full information to make decisions. Um, that all of us in this room have a responsibility, and I think one of the um, speakers this morning also mentioned that, perhaps Mel, to, it's our responsibility to go back to our respective organizations or member groups and make sure that they have the information about this topic. Let's just start with us, within family, and let it grow. Um, that messages need to be delivered, again, to the multiple stakeholders. So if you think about your spheres of influence, it's the women, it's the families, it's the people in a church community, it's in an employer-based uh, situation. Um, you know, the, the, you, you can start that way and, and the word will grow. And I think now we're fortunate in the early years, say, of, social, of uh, folic acid, we didn't have social media messages. Now we have them. And it's a cheap way to get your message out. Cheap and effective and things just take off. So I would encourage us to think about the opportunities with social um, media. You know, the one would be even um, here at March of Dines, we do Twitter chats. And there you, we have these little chats. I don't get it because I don't... You know, you can see I can barely use a, a slide projector. But um, <laughs> fortunately, I have a team who does social media, and they get the word out, and we do Twitter chats with people on all sorts of topics, and you reach millions in an hour, literally millions, because each person with whom we engage has their own group of people, and it just spreads, and it's just really a wonderful thing. And then, of course, just the power of partnerships. Um, we, we believe that antenatal corticosteroids need to be addressed as part of pre, um, prenatal care, and maybe my colleagues, one of them I believe that it might be appropriate to talk in preconception, so we'll see if they uh, take that on in a few minutes. But really, this is um, SNS, the signs and symptoms. I mean, that, certainly we do need to talk more about signs and symptoms of preterm labor. I think we've heard it from Dr. Cuddlechuck, it's really important to hear from women what they know, what they need to know, how we should talk with them. So it's very, very important to do focus groups and learn from them so we can, so we can go forward and do the right thing for them. Um, and that we need to use our learnings uh, from these conversations with women and put them into some sort of format, whether it's media or print, et cetera. Um, it's also important to understand why women may choose not to use these steroids. I don't know if we have that information, but that's something to consider, and what are the learnings from that experience is. Certainly for providers, we need to do pro perhaps more training, and the opportunities there around continuing education seem to be somewhat effective when training doctors. Um, you all know better. And we have opportunities now with technology that we never really had, and not just the social media, but with apps and whatever else is available. Many opportunities uh, to educate, to engage, and to power. So um, March of Dimes is all about babies, and so on behalf of the babies and for myself, say thank you very much. So my two um, panelists here are Dr. Sarah Verpiece and Dr. Carla Damas. So, um, I think Sarah's going to go first. And Sarah's currently the executive director for the Center for Maternal and um, Infant Health at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Sarah. So it's a pleasure to be here with uh, two women who I admire very much, with uh, Scott Burns, who just left, but he used to be my boss. And um, with uh, Dr. Cuddlechuck, who has been my mentor, um, dissertation committee member, et cetera, for more years than I'm going to say. And I am such a good student of his that as he was giving his presentation this morning, I was checking off all of the points that I had prepared <laughs> for this part of the presentation. Um, but don't worry, I came up with some more. Um, but I want to start off by saying amen to a lot of the things that um, Milt said earlier. Um, I thought that he made some really important points. So um, I think some things to add to the conversation, um, and something that I think is really missing, is that we really don't take much time to listen to what women themselves have to say. There's very little qualitative research that's published where we've actually sat down with women, very diverse groups of women, and asked them about how they feel about their care, their concerns, how they learn, how they want to get information, how they feel that they're able to have their voice heard, if they're calling in an emergency, if they're calling, they're not sure they're having an emergency. 
Um, and I think to the conversation on health equity, I'm from the South, and I firmly believe that there are pockets and places where there's significant trust issues in terms of how someone might feel to raise her hand and say, something's not right. Um, and so I think we have to do this research. I think Janice described it beautifully with some of the research that um, March of Dimes has, has done. So I think before we um, talk about how providers talk to women and talk about campaigns, we have to listen to women first. So that's my first point. Um, so secondly, um, so there's an article that I use all the time. Um, it was uh, written by Michael Liu and co-authored with none other than Milt Cuddlechuck and others called The 12-Point Plan to Close the Black-White Gap in Birth Outcomes Through a Life Course Approach. And um, one piece of this plan talks about um, the importance of reproductive social capital, which is kind of a complex concept which we won't go into, but essentially it means that communities, families, businesses, and partners have a sense of responsibility and engagement in supporting the um, healthy arrival and nurturing of the next generation. And so I think putting this in context, um, the importance of engaging support people around a pregnant woman, her sister, mother, um, best friend, husband, partner, is important because who is she going to call first? She's probably going to call her best friend or her mom. So I think as we're thinking about um, education and having this conversation, we need to cast our net a little bit broader. Um, I've heard definitely different conversation around here about, well, we don't want to scare women. So I think that's assuming a lot um, about how what we say is going to land with women. So it kind of goes back to my point is we need to ask them. But I'd also kind of like to point out that knowledge is power. And um, again, living in the South, we get hurricanes. So what is something that we all have? We have our hurricane plan. And uh, they have found that even with working with children um, in Australia that are uh, subject to frequent wildfires, when people are prepared and they have information, they are less afraid. So I think that as we're considering strategies, thinking about having an emergency plan, getting full information early in a pregnancy, 20, 22 weeks, getting the numbers, making sure everyone is on task, knowing where to go, is a way that we can provide knowledge and confidence and maybe not fear. So something to think about. Um, another point, um, so there has been a lot of uh, momentum lately around maternal safety initiatives. Um, are any of you involved in the AMCHIP, um, Merck for Mothers, maternal safety initiatives, any of your states? North Carolina is, right. So there's been a lot more conversation about maternal mortality, maternal morbidity, and those groups also thinking about how do we talk about women, we don't want to scare women. And so I would just encourage this group as you're going forward to look for some synergy with some of those other movements that are kind of talking with mom about these kind of similar scary but very important things. Um, and I think that's also going to be beneficial for many of us in states that are also being asked to do a lot of these different initiatives. Um, so something to consider. Um, I also think, um, so this is the preconception piece. So both of these ladies are also on the National Preconception Health and Healthcare Initiative um, and uh, that I get the pleasure to help lead. And I think we talk about um, HELP syndrome, but we need to think about what is the impact of a woman having had HELP syndrome and her risk of having chronic disease in the future. What are we doing with mom after she's had that pregnancy to think about what is, how does that impact her future reproductive life planning? And that giving her the information that she needs and, and the family needs to make a decision um, about how much time to wait if they want another pregnancy, if they want another pregnancy, assuring them about the risk, whatever that might be. I think we have to keep that as part of the equation and part of the conversation. And as my last point, um, thinking about health equity, I do think that it's important that we collect data so that we can look at our systems of care um, and be able to have firm footing to say either we are or aren't giving equal care. And I think we also need to consider bias-proof systems. So those are some of my columns. And I will turn it over to Carla, to, who also has a page of revised points, thanks to Milt. Just kidding. Well, thank you, and I, I really think this is a very important conference, obviously, and we want to try to, and we all try to be evidence-based providers and make sure that our families that we have the privilege of serving also are aware of the things that they can be engaged and make a real difference. And 
I'm also an epidemiologist, and you know, with respect to years of potential life loss, this is, as Russ said, huge. So we want to make sure that we're not missing opportunities because it can be devastating, particularly the combination when indicated of um, using antenatal steroids along with uh, surfactant. And so I think this topic is enormous, and we certainly agree that it needs to be the community around the woman empowered so that they can all move forward and make a difference. I keep thinking about my experience with folic acid when I was on the faculty at Einstein in the Bronx, and I did a big project there called FAB, Folic Acid for the Bronx. And they came up with the title, that's the other issue. What works in Atlanta may not work in the Bronx, may not work in you know, New Mexico, so although national campaigns are great, they all need to be tailored to what are the issues in your own community. And your community's voice has to come up with the framework and the taglines and other things. I remember one of the most effective things we did in the Bronx for folic acid was the young people that we were trying to target because high levels of sexual activity and you know a lot of teen pregnancy at that time and still, but it's come down somewhat. The nations had great success. And so one of their big um, taglines was free acid and we would put that out and everyone would run. And of course then you'd have to mitigate what was going on because you don't want a lot of angry people in the Bronx for very long, young people. <laughs> when they thought acid was something else. And that speaks to the importance of what are we going to call this? I mean, Anne remembers all of us the 2005 Invitational Workshop by NICHD on near-term deliveries. And you know, that's almost like a little bit pregnant. You're either pregnant or not. And at the end of that, people decided it's late preterm because those babies are still late preterm and in fact are the largest proportion of most NICUs. And so, we want to think about what we should call this. And it gets confusing to the public. It's, and yet we have to respect that they do learn difficult terms. They learn it in other conditions. And this one is so important for the life course perspective. What you do at the beginning, I need not tell this group, is going to last uh, throughout your life and is even intergenerational. So I think this is a very serious charge to do this right. And yet we want to listen to our, our providers too in terms of not over-treating. But I want to mention when I did the Healthy Babies Are Worth the Weight in Kentucky, we did a lot of surveys after many focus groups to develop the materials like the brain card and all of those issues. But we found out a huge disparity between what the providers said they were doing and what the women receiving services. And at that time, we were certainly concerned about preventing preterm birth, so progesterone was an issue. And 98% of the providers said, you bet we recommend or offer it. And when you spoke to the women who should have been offered it, it was 13% had even heard the word. Now, again, you get a lot of information. It doesn't mean it was really that low, but it was a very consistent finding throughout the state. So that type of thing has to be looked at. So I think a big part of empowering communities and women and families is to make sure that our providers are educated. And I have spent the last three years on the faculty at Northeastern University in the College of Health Sciences, Bouvet Health Sciences. So I have pharmacists, I have physical, uh, phys physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, doctorate in nursing practice. And I was appalled to see how low the level of knowledge is around anything at all to do with antenatal steroids. Now, you could argue that a lot of these people aren't going to be in perinatal providers in their career, but the problem is in this country, a lot of women get into trouble and they go to an emergency room, so people have to be aware of something that is truly evidence-based that can make such a profound difference. So I think we have to be looking at the kind of provider education and toolkits around this issue and yet integrate it with other evidence-based types of interventions such as progesterone and other things during pregnancy. And so I'm thrilled at the March of Dimes because well, I did the same type of search and found out that we need to link and some places have the message of progesterone with signs and symptoms of preterm labor so that once you've had a hopefully spontaneous preterm labor since we're working on the other non-indicated, but the point is that you would then the next time have that information and be able to have a discussion with your provider around that. And we need to link the antenatal steroid message with that as well. And that's not being done. It just isn't out there yet. And by now it's, it should certainly be out there. So we have to think about the providers though, not just being, um, you know, as we found from the folic acid campaign, there's a lot of people and pharmacists are a big part of the interprofessional teams now. 
So we have to think about the physicians, we have to think about the nurse practitioners. There are many communities that we know don't have access to obstetricians, certainly the nurse midwives, and the PAs, and all of these people that have more and more of a role in providing um, services and prescribing and actually dealing with our families. Another thing that I think is important to think about is um, to look at the whole content of prenatal care and maybe consider a major redesign of that as well. Because if we all went back every year, you think of the women that have had more than one child, and if you had to keep going back to the same grade in school, after a while, people get disengaged. So we need to build on these experiences. And certainly, um, we need to hear the messages like we heard today in our conference that, you know, even though complications, you don't want to scare people, but I have feelings about that as well. I think you're informing people if you do it right. We want people to have, like we're trying to get a reproductive life plan, we would like to have a complications of pregnancy plan that wouldn't just focus on preterm labor per se, but preterm labor is something that's one out of 10 individuals that get pregnant, and preterm birth is still more than, you know, it's closer now to one out of nine, but it's, it's still a very common event, and other things are less common. So knowing early enough in pregnancy that in the event you do have to go to the hospital, just like you mentioned the hurricane plan, well, you know, we now have Edith. How many of you have heard of Edith for the exit drill in the home? This is what the fire departments are having everyone do, and your children know about this if they're in grade school. So it's not that 10% of us are going to have home fires. We hope not. But yet everyone's practicing this. So we need to give materials early enough to our women in pregnancy so that if they do have to come for services, they know the transportation options. They don't have to actually come like we have the NICU visit for high-risk families. I think we'll have hordes of people showing up on the obstetrical units. We don't want that, but at least materials so people don't have to spend time trying to figure out what to do and to develop a plan that in case it happens to them, that they will indeed know who to call and how to call no matter when it happens, in the middle of the night or any time. So we can do a lot more with that. And I think that because of the evidence-based interventions and this huge gap between people understanding them and even a gap between those women that are, quote, eligible and it's indicated not receiving them needs to be addressed. And of course, it has to be culturally sensitive, age and health literacy appropriate like everything else that we do. A big, big issue, but we can't keep doing the same thing. And the centering of pregnancy is a wonderful example where you empower women and it's facilitated by providers and making sure that those types of forums as well include some of this essential information in the materials that they cover. The next to the last thing I wanted to mention has to do with how we could take advantage of the fact that whatever we're learning from focus groups and we do know that these messages are important, that we take it to places that have the highest yield potential and the lowest hanging fruit. So partnering with healthy start sites, because we know they have, by definition, very high rates of infant mortality and of, um, of preterm birth being the leading determinant of infant mortality in African American communities. And we know that's gonna look very different by the fall, the healthy start map for the United States. And also the COIN initiative now for the collaborative, um, collaborative Improvement and Innovative Networks. It's an unusual acronym because it also stands for me as a nurse as the Council of International Neonatal Nurses, but a lot of people have the same acronym. But you know, they started out in Region 4 and 6, which have very high rates of preterm birth, particularly for African American communities and infant mortality, and they're really looking at innovative ways to do things. So if we can try to make progress in terms of closing some of these gaps with um, the issue around antenatal steroids and other evidence-based practices during pregnancy and even before would be great. And so that gets to the other issue of when we do these types of relationships, the community includes the grandparents and whoever else is important in the life of that woman and who she works with to be um, able to communicate and she can rely on the information just like knowing which of the national networks and agencies, you should feel confident about the accuracy of the information. And certainly our professional organizations are key. 
And the last thing I really wanted to mention is the importance of thinking how we can do a better job with all of this technology that's out there. There have been references to it. They have text for babies, and I'm not quite sure what the demographics of who's using that, although we're getting more and more data, but we could probably do better on that. But I didn't see a single message about antenatal steroids in the messaging that goes out. I've requested for a list of all of them. I haven't received it yet. So if anyone's an expert here on text for baby messages and there is already one, let me know. I could not see that. But there is a message on signs and symptoms of preterm labor. And so there needs to be one on this as well. And for those people that have had a previous preterm birth and if it's appropriate on progesterone. And you can go way beyond that. We're working in uh, Boston in the um, BU School of Medicine. I've been working with Dr. Brian Jack, who's the chair of the Family Medicine Department for quite a while now, and we have a virtual patient advocate. And this is an extremely high-level computerized avatar, and that individual does share decision-making with young African-American women this project is geared at right now and does a risk assessment of over 100 risks. And then out of that is created a My Health To-Do list. And on average, we're finding women, and we've done it on college students, on something called the Preconception Peer Educators, which is a program through the Office of Minority Health. And uh, we're finding on average about 23 risks per woman. And then the woman negotiates with Gabby when she, her name is Gabby, it's really Gabrielle, but she says to call her Gabby for short. And they negotiate which one of the risks she may want to work on. And then behind this is motivational interviewing, and it's based on the trans-theoretical model of behavior change, and we're measuring how we move the woman from pre-contemplation to hopefully action or somewhere along the sta stages of that model. And we are just launching now a large randomized clinical trial. We had one on 100 women and showed a major impact of Gabby because women felt very comfortable because the provider may not have time to spend explaining everything. We could take this model and adapt it to prenatal care, and one of the issues would be antenatal steroids. That can take a lot of time. And these types of technology allow the woman to spend as much time as she would like finding out more about it, going back over things. And this model, the reason we're using for preconception health, it was originally designed to decrease hospital readmission so that when you were being discharged, you'd get this kiosk, and that time was Elizabeth or Louise, and you'd spend time with them on your discharge planning and go home with a laptop, and they were able to reduce rehospitalization by 30%. So they show that this kind of time that some people want, and you can tailor it to different cultures and different types of needs and literacy levels, and you can even now, we're doing a 3D Gabby, and she can actually look the way you want to. You can pick her hairstyle, you can pick a male if you want, you can pick whatever you would like Gabby to have. When we did focus groups, young women, African American women in the Bronx, in, in Boston, excuse me, I still haven't made that transition, they uh, wanted different earrings, different hairstyles, different colors that they'd feel comfortable talking to that individual. So there's a lot of potential there, and I think that we need to think about delivering, because so much of our services has to do with meaningful shared decision making and education, and there are so many opportunities in order to make that work. And I think it can be easily, easily adapted to prenatal care. That's our next step. And right now, again, we're focusing on prior to conception. But even then, people should get the notion that there are people that have these complications of pregnancy, although pregnancy is not a medical event per se. You know, normally, if you take numbers, the vast majority of people have a very good outcome. But people have to be prepared, just like you have to have a plan to get out of your house in case it catches on fire. And these are the kinds of things that we need to do. And then we are also dealing with the issue of some patient, of, of some metrics, because I agree certainly with, uh, you know, how important that is in terms of measuring things. And patient activation measure scales are very useful in trying to understand whether or not these types of resources for the patient and the family are useful, and that's a whole other area of research. So just a few um, additional ideas, and I guess we can open it up to comments and questions.
I have to say I've known Carla for many, many years. This is the first time I've never seen her use slides. Just amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. Dr. Burns. Thank you, guys. I have, I have two comments, actually. One is um, um, around, you heard about healthy babies are worth the wait a couple of times. Uh, Janice mentioned it, and Carla mentioned it. And I think in the context of our, our discussion about ACT and what we might do in the larger context with the big picture, I just want to mention that healthy babies are worth the wait is actually a sub-brand for the March of Dimes. It evolved into a sub-brand. And what I mean is that we actually started out as a community program and then as a demonstration project in Kentucky, which bundled evidence-based interventions to reduce preventable preterm birth. We then launched a national education and awareness campaign, which is what Janice was talking about. And so we've continued with the community program that it also incorporates the education and awareness messages, and we also have a quality improvement service package where we partner with over 100 hospitals, and we've also used the sub-brand there. So I think there's maybe something in there in terms of if you're going to do, we're going to do something around ACT or ANS or whatever we're going to call it, you know, it's has, you know, it should be multi, it would be multifactorial. And then Janice mentioned the the tool, the toolkit earlier. I want to clarify that there are two toolkits. One is the toolkit to reduce early elective deliveries, and the awareness materials that Janice was talking about are incorporated there. But the toolkit you'll be hearing about tomorrow is actually the preterm labor assessment toolkit, which actually talks more specifically about antenatal corticosteroids. So, thanks. I just want to uh, comment briefly on the idea of shared decision making with antenatal corticosteroids. Although it's certainly important, I think we have to be really careful about how we craft that message. Um, you know, one example of shared decision making from the pediatric world would be vaccines. And, uh, you know, Measles is at an all-time high right now. So this is, this is a, a, a therapy that's given to the mother but benefits the baby. And um, it, it, it's, it, there are really no downsides to it. Um, so how we craft that message is certainly very important. It's also very different because the baby does not have an autonomous say in this. Um, so I would ask from an ethical standpoint, is it really allowable for a mother to say no? in this situation. Yes, it is. Yes, it yes. is. I'm being provocative. I know what the answer is. But, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm just saying this, this is different than in other ways how we make, do shared decision making. Well, I don't think it's that different. And I don't know if this works, but it doesn't matter. The point is that, you know, if you provide the information in a way that people understand what the benefits and the risks are, most people that want to do the best for their unborn baby there's not going to be an issue. And I think one of the problems with vaccine issues, as we all know, that famous Lancet article, I mean, to this day, people think that it causes autism, despite all of retractions and everything else. So it is shared decision making, though. And it is their right to make the final decision. It's our responsibility to provide them with the culturally sensitive, age appropriate, you know, health literacy appropriate information in a way that in their community, then they do make that the decision to the best, and, and I think that all of us would agree we can't force people to take antenatal steroids. Hi, Beth Collin Sharp from ARC. I just can't resist um, saying that the original funding for Project RED and the Gabby Preconception Care, and I believe some um, of the work on patient activation measures um, came from ARC and Absolutely. our patient uh, 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 HIT portfolio health health information technology portfolio. Yes. Yeah. Rob Silverman from Syracuse. As I look at this, there's no question that education of women is important, but if we really want to empower them, we have to make it so their physicians are buying into it. And we have to look at the lessons that we learned from the less than 39 week deliveries where it really took off when we developed things like a hard stop where a physician could not perform an induction of labor. We look at the Department of Health in New York State reviewing every case of less than 39 week deliveries. We look at insurance companies reducing uh, reimbursements to physicians and hospitals by 10% if they had an un, uh, not an undocumented, but an unindicated induction of labor or delivery less than 39 weeks. And if we want this to succeed, as much as I hate to say so, there has to be 
some teeth to what we're saying, and we have to have buy-ins from the Department of Health where there will actually be reviews of these type of cases and uh, a system in place similar in some way to what happened with the less than 39-week deliveries. No, I, I completely agree. I think we can create demand on the part of women for different services, but, um, and we've seen that in some cases with preconception counseling, women saying, oh, I want preconception counseling, and the provider saying, oh, I don't know what that is, I don't know how to bill for it. So I think that it has to be both creating of demand and then having providers ready to listen to what she's saying and provide that service. And I agree that we have to have um, the carrot and the stick on the provider mm -hmm. as well. So Russ Ruthin again, um, to, uh, to Janice's credit, uh, consumer marketing and public awareness is, is rocket science. And a lot of the stuff that she was talking about there with the, the folic, uh, folic acid awareness campaign and so forth, it's, it's really s tough, stop, st tough stuff. Um, but there is so much to be done um, before one even got to that stage. So I don't want people to come away with uh, some of the ideas, oh, it's so difficult and we're going to frighten women and these mm -hmm. sorts of things. I want us to think more about context-based information, which is um, in centering pregnancy, a wonder wonderful new model, right? That's a, an opportunity to teach women there if they don't know it about steroids. Um, in maternal child health education programs, mm -hmm. that's a wonderful place to do it. On the new March of Dimes antenatal steroid webpage, um, that's a good place to do it, as well as, you know, just now, you look up on what to expect um, there's a question on there, I could only find one, quick Google search again, you know, steroids, is there a danger to me taking it? And someone answers that. Um, these are the sorts of opportunities that are available and are much less difficult and much less expensive than a consumer marketing campaign. Right. Okay. I agree. Hi, uh, Lori Reese, March of Dimes. Um, speaking from the perspective of someone who has had steroid injections several times with a couple of different pregnancies, I have to say there is one downside, they hurt like the dickens. So if you haven't had one, <laughs> they are quite painful. But my, my real point is that I think that for women, fear is, is hard to, to measure, you know, determining what scares women and what doesn't scare women, it's different for everyone. But I think what scares most people the most is what they don't know more than what they know. And when you inform women in a productive way and an effective way, they feel more in control of their own health care and are able to make better decisions. And if we're not doing that now, then this is the reason we're here today because we can do a better job of that and in the future. I would uh, second that and say I think there's a certain amount of semantics here. For example, um, saying it's their choice is all well and good. They do have the choice to decline. I don't think they necessarily have the choice to insist they get steroids if a doctor truly doesn't feel it's uh, indicated. So we have to make sure we walk that line. As far as scaring them, I mean, I think the baby with the different brain size, you know, certainly was a very effective graphic. It'd be almost like showing a baby with CP and saying, if you don't get steroids, this could happen. Well, I think that might be overdoing it. So I think we have to be very clear. What we're really doing is not so much creating demand, but creating awareness of what the options are, what they should at least have in the back of their mind. And just like they might know that there are some drugs that uh, supposedly suppress contractions, they may not know they're ineffective, but, um, <laughs> but the same thing would apply to steroids. It shouldn't be that they're demanding it or saying they it's my choice, I want to have the steroids. They should be aware it's an option. It has some indications, it also has some contraindications. There's a certain amount of judgment there, but it is important that they be aware, so if the issue doesn't come up, maybe they could say, well, you know, I've heard about steroids. Uh, is this something that, should, are steroids right for me? Well, you know, this kind of thing. Right, yeah, totally agree. So well, and, and I think that this kind of goes back to what I was mentioning about some of the maternal safety work and Merck for Mothers. So I know that there has been some focus group work in uh, with Mario's group um, in Manhattan, and uh, you know, asking women how they feel about maternal mortality, and yeah, they're pretty <laughs> worried about that. So I do think that that we have a number of issues that are coming together. That if we had some good research money, we could go out and actually get some good information from our target audiences in terms of what they hear and what they what they want to hear. And I think it's important since seems like there's a lot of maternal safety work that's going on. 
Method uh, Stooley, uh, Washington University. So uh, sitting down here, coming from a tertiary institution where, you know, sometimes, you know, you I wonder whether there are places that are not giving steroids uh, continuously. I wanted to raise one point, though, that the administration of steroids is different from many other health interventions, where a judgment has to be made that this patient is at high risk for delivering preterm now, and we have one or at most two chances to give it. That's, that, I think that is a really important consideration where an increase in demand by patients may result in patients who have their one course of steroids, and since we know that 80% of those we think will deliver preterm will not, and then when they need it, we cannot administer another dose. So I think this campaign has to be more nuanced than medical interventions that can be taken anytime and repeatedly in an unlimited manner. And Santa Gidana from A1 again, and thank you for that very perfect segue into my comment. Um, my comment has to do with um, this in terms of consumer messaging, but also in terms of um, potential discussion at this meeting about strategies when you are faced with the urgent um, or emergent situation where you, if you are going to act, you have to act quickly. Um, so I think it's important from the consumer messaging perspective um, to craft the appropriate messages about how one might handle um, the administration of corticosteroids in an urgent situation. And I think that one of our challenges is to come up with strategies um, that will allow us to, um, you know, is there, the question would be, is there a way of building in corticosteroid administration into a, you know, a rubric for managing a, the urgent um, delivery. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, last question. Uh, this is actually a comment. I'm Leona Shields from uh, California from Department of Public Health. And two things. Um, the Gabby is kind of an interesting concept to use that for um, having interaction. In fact, there were some studies that were done with um, teenagers about reproductive health, and they were far more um, able to talk about what they were doing or not doing to a computer than they were to a provider. So I think there's some messaging for us to think about for the future about how we could incorporate that into our practice and get feedback from that. The patient might not be willing to discuss face-to-face -face with the provider, but would be sharing with a computer. The other thing is, um, had not heard the um, antenatal corticosteroid treatment concept before today. And sitting here, my reaction to it, I'm going to um, say that I'm for ACT because it's an action word. People will remember that. We want them to think about the last word, which is treatment. Okay. And I think that um, along with ACT, part of what we want to do is to buy time so that I think that's part of the part where some of the consumer education comes in is acting in time so that then the clinicians can have their opportunity to do what's best so I like act as well okay all right let's thank our panelists and our speakers